Hey, so Once on this Island is now open. And guess what? We got a bunch of really, really great reviews. But the cool thing is, this is one of those times where the reviews are matching what's happening in the theater with that audience as well. Everybody's having an awesome time. Come see it, onceonthisisland.com. Tickets are going quickly. I want to be a producer with a hit show on Broadway. I want to be. Hello, everybody. My name is Ken Davenport. This is the Producer's Perspective Podcast. And yes, I do have a cold. Thank you for listening today. You tuned in to a great episode today. We don't just have an A-lister on the show. We've got an A-plus lister on the show today. Please welcome to the podcast four-time Tony Award winner and a bazillion-time nominee for so many different awards, Mr. Jerry Zaks. Welcome, Jerry. Thank you, Ken. So Jerry helmed the ship of the original productions of Lemme a Tenor, Six Degrees of Separation, and the revival of Guys and Dolls that blew up Nathan Lane in the early 90s. And he is still cranking them out. This past year, he's had three hits on the boards. Hello, Dolly, A Bronx Tale, and just recently, Meteor Shower. So, Jerry, you started in the business as an actor, is that correct? Yes, I did, Ken. I fell in love uh, with the uh, theater and all I wanted to do was act and so I trained to be an actor uh, in grad school and then came to New York in the fall of 69 and acted for 10 very happy years. Do you remember the show or the thing that made you fall in love with the dream of being on stage? Oh know? sure I do. I fell in love uh, at Winter Carnival at Dartmouth but it wasn't with my blind date it was with it was with a production that the Dartmouth Theater Company the Dartmouth Players did of Wonder Wonderful Town. I had tickets. I brought my blind date to Wonderful Town, and I was blown away. When I say f- I fell in love, uh, it's a love affair that's lasted for <laughs> about 50 plus years. I don't know what it was. I hadn't been a musical theater person growing up. I was more a stickball person, I think, and a doo-wop music person. And all of a sudden, I experienced a kind of ecstatic experience from that show. The music, the f- the comedy, the the lights, the costumes, the the jo- it just elicited a kind of joy from inside me that that was the moment. That was the moment when I broke my parents' heart. <laughs> and how did you make that transition from being an actor to a director, and why? Sure. I was a founding member of the Ensemble Studio Theater. Uh, it was my acting home. Kurt Dempster, the artistic director and founder, was my acting teacher. And while I was acting at the Ensemble Studio Theater, a friend of mine, uh, Bill Swakowski is his name, brought me a script that he had read and said, Jared, there's this part I want to play. Do you want to direct it? And I really didn't understand what he was asking me to do, but I did sort of from having been directed a few times as an actor. And so I said, sure. And then I fell in love all over again. I just, orchestrating the life between two or more actors on stage with a good script gave me a joy then. This was quite a while ago. This was in the mid, mid seventies or late seventies. And I just loved it. And I found that my self experiencing the kind of joy that I used to experience as an actor, but this time from standing in the back listening to the audience you know and and I and I suppose the control freak part of being a director <laughs> has always been inside me and and I, I think in fact it limited my ability as an actor because I was always watching myself you know and I think the best actors are not watching themselves so that was the moment it was at the ensemble studio theater it's funny that that's why I stopped acting myself too much of a control freak so I started producing of course. instead to control more of it of course how much of your success do you credit to you getting out and starting a theater company back then? Was that, how uh, instrumental was that? It was part of it. I think it was important to have a home. It was important to have a place to go to where I, we could try out scenes and take class and do productions. It was, it was important to help identify yourself as an actor. But I think that as important as that was, I think so was just, I, I think uh, uh, relentless is sort of a word that Andre Bishop used to describe me. And I thought, hmm, that's pretty good. Yeah, I wanted to work really badly. And I did, uh, I pursued every opportunity. And when I 
got the opportunity, I wanted to make damn sure that I was really prepared and really ready. So, it's like, and luck, and luck. And, and then lastly, the talents of other people, you know, particularly as a director. It's so collaborative, you know, and you may have in your mind's eye as a director the sound of what the play should be, or maybe even the look, but you can't execute it without big talents in costumes and lights and scenery and, and of course, the actors, you know. And so, you know, I, I, I think it's the good fortune to have worked with the best people. Any advice from mentors that you got back when you were starting out that you still think about today or the best wisdom? Any words of advice? <laughs> yeah, you know, someone once told me, an agent once said, insecurity after a certain age is no longer attractive. And that sort of got my attention because um, I had always featured a, a kind of, oh, gee, I don't really know what I'm doing attitude because I thought it was, you know, it was it was better, it was more useful than just simply being confident in what I knew and what I could do. So that was, that was good advice. I, I didn't really train at the knee of another director. I think I served my apprenticeship for being a director as an actor for 10 years, you know, on Broadway in commercials and movies and soap operas, uh, off Broadway, off, off Broadway, on broad, it just, you know, the more of it, the better. And each one taught me something. What was the first show you directed on Broadway? Hmm. What was, I think it was officially, well, the house of blue leaves, John Ware's great play. I directed it at Lincoln center when they were attempting to restart the Lincoln Center Theater. And we did it originally in the new house, the downstairs theater. And it went so well that it moved to the Beaumont upstairs and then technically became a Broadway play, you know, and Tony eligible and all that. So I suppose that was the first one. And yeah, that was, uh, you know, and in fact, John Ware and I are working on a new play. So yeah, I try to protect the most important connections, professional connections in my life. And the one I have with with John is very special. How do you pick a project now? I mean, obviously, it's a little different than when you were relentless back then trying to do anything you could. Now, you can be a little more choosy. Yeah. So how do you decide what what to direct? You know, I, I, I uh, if it's a, if it's entitled a comedy, the script, I read the script. You know, if it's a comedy, it better make me laugh out loud. If it makes me laugh out loud, then I then I think about it seriously and I try to imagine what it would, you know, what it would look like, what it would sang, sing like, what would it sound like. But I've got to fall in love with it, Ken. I, I don't I don't know. It's it's a it's a weird, strange, you know, process. Uh, I think reading something or listening to to a score, if I can imagine. Imagine, and if I'm if I'm brought to a certain kind of ecstatic place, imagining it, then I, I that's enough for me to want to put it on stage and have it hopefully do the same thing. So, uh, so, sometimes I'm inspired by seeing something, you know. I mean, when I was a kid, I'm going to segue to Hello Dolly, okay? So Please. when I was a kid, uh, meaning about 18, 19, it was, it was about 53, 54 years ago. I had just gotten the the bug at Dartmouth College. I had seen Wonderful Town, et cetera, et cetera, and I came into New York. And I stood in the back of the St. James and saw Hello, Dolly, you know, talking about sources of inspiration. And I'll never forget what it did to me. It was, uh, again, it, it took me to an ecstatic, special, joyous place that I didn't understand, but I was just knocked out by. So I went back and I stood another time to see, first I saw Carol Channing, then I went back again and I saw Ginger Rogers or maybe Pearl Bailey, but I saw both of them. I stood in the back of the St. James three times because I was so blown away by this show. And so I dreamt even then of being able to do a show like that that would do to an audience what it did to me. And here here we are, you know, 53, 50, whatever it is, years later, and um, Dolly's, uh, Dolly's up and running. And doing pretty well. Over yeah, there. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you mentioned comedy, and you mentioned uh, something making you laugh out loud. So let's talk about that a little bit, because there was this movie back in the day called The King of Comedy. Maybe yeah, maybe. sure, sure. I think of you as the king of musical comedy. <laughs> and you've done some incredibly funny stuff. And what I want to talk about is that difference between, look, plays and musicals were not meant to be read, right? They were meant to be shown to people. And what you do so well is translate that funny from the page to the stage. How do you, how do you do that or see that? Or what's it, that process? It, it, like? it all, it, it all begins with the writing. The writing has got to be vivid and clear and, and life and death, Ken. Life and death, man, you know? And that's true of plays and musicals. I mean, honestly, my 
approach to musicals is no different to play than my approach to plays and vice versa. Musicals just have more more moving parts, you know. You have more you have more tools to tell your story that's going to hopefully transport the, the audience. But it always begins with the words. For example, if you pick up House of Blue Leaves by John Gray, I was just talking about it the other day, so it's fresh in my mind. You know, you can read from page one a story of a couple who are in a bad relationship, who have been married a long time, and the man's need to escape that relationship is life and death. Life and death. And the woman's need, his wife's need to keep her husband from going away is life and death. So now all I need are actors who are capable of executing that, pretending that their lives are at, at stake, because that's the source of best of the best comedy, you know. There's nothing worse than someone trying to be funny. And the best comic actors will only rarely be caught trying to be funny by me in rehearsal. It will be pointed out to them, and they will go, oh, yeah, I see, because they're good and they're professional. But I monitor the believable behavior, and I insist that it be as life and death as possible. Does that mean loud and fast and, rel and... No, not necessarily. Sometimes, yes. But I insist on what I'm doing now. I am getting the attention off myself onto you because I want you to understand what I'm trying to say. And I want whoever is listening to understand what I'm trying to say very badly. And so as a result, because I'm not worried about what I sound like, what I look like, or how I'm standing, or how I'm intoning what I'm trying to say to you, someone listening to this or watching the two of us will be more interested. So I, I, I insist on that kind of behavior from the actors in a play. Play the play. Don't play yourself. Don't don't show me anything. Get the attention off yourself and onto the other guy. What are you trying to do to him or her? You know, are you trying to tell them off? Are you trying to seduce them? Are you trying to bargain with them? Are you? What are you trying to do? And I, I, I don't know. I help actors find the behavior that protects the possibility of a happy ending as long as possible. If an actor can find that, it will liberate them and free them to really play the play. If, if they know what it is that they're trying to do to protect the possibility that they will get what they want, that they will probably not go wrong. Anyway, that's a little long-winded, but you get what I'm trying to say. Right? Uh, very, very good <laughs> answer. Can we talk a little bit specifically about that process in your rehearsals? Do sure. you improv? Do you do table work? Like, what, is it different for a meteor shower versus House of Blue Leaves back then versus no, the Bronx Tale? No, no, no. The process is the same. I, I rarely, if ever, use improvisation because I, I don't know how to use it as a tool. By the time I go into rehearsal, the playwright and I have burnished the script to the point of where every and, every the, every from, every word, there is a reason for it. And so I make it clear to the actors on anything I'm doing that the script is not to be used as a point of departure. I'm not really, you know, if in the course of rehearsal someone comes up with hopefully feeling free enough to come up with something that no one expected and it's fantastic and the playwright is smart, it will become part of the script. So yes. The approach to creating the environment for me to protect the possibility of getting the best work out of the actors as possible is to ensure that it be a safe room. You know, I don't allow anybody in that rehearsal room ever until we are ready to present a, a run through. I am not interested in anybody watching the process because frankly, I don't care how experienced or how old or how a person actor is. When we begin the process, they're vulnerable. And they're vulnerable to being embarrassed. And my primary rule is no one ever gets embarrassed in the rehearsal room. You know, the Talmud has much to say about how embarrassing someone is very, is close, is akin to murdering someone because of what it does. So I try to legislate that my rehearsal room is a place where no one will get embarrassed. So it's made clear actors are not to give other actors notes. Actors, you know, actors should tend to their own gardens, if you will, and take care of their own business and trust me to orchestrate it, you know? I'm, are you, I, I'm, excuse me, Jerry, but I'm looking upstage th at this moment. I say, I see, and there's a reason for it. Or, huh, I'll fix that. Yes. Uh, I also make it clear to actors that if they're really interested in me hearing what they have to say, that they say it to me privately. 
because I'm not good at coming up with an answer in front of an audience. I can if I have to, obviously, you know? And sometimes big note sessions involve, you know, 30 people or whatever. But so, so again, I, tr I emphasize communication and respect and everything else will take care of itself. And then we go to work. We sit down and we read through the play and we read through the play again. Questions? All right. And I'll try to answer that. If the playwright is ha happily there, the playwright will answer it. And the actors get a chance to experience what it's like to have the words come out of their mouth for the first time. It's very valuable. After a couple of days of that, we start blocking. We start staging. I prepared a blocking to within an inch of its life that I pretend that I don't, that I don't have. You pretend you don't have it. Right, and I'll say, well, let's, uh, well, yes, of course I have. I, I, I have accounted for a draft in my head of where the actors would go when based on what they're trying to do. Now, there's, that's just as a, that's just as a, as a foundation. And I try not to make it, you know, I try, I try to use that as a point of departure for myself and as a security blanket for myself. So I can say to actor A, okay, let's take it from the top. Why don't you enter from there? Oh, well, oh, is it? Because, yeah, now. Yeah. The great actors will not ask me why, you know. The insecure ones, the ones who receive bad training, unfortunately, <laughs> will want to complicate or overcomplicate, you know. He's coming from there because that's where the garage in is, it got garages, and he's just been fixing a flat. So he's coming from there. But more importantly, what is he, why is he coming in here? What's he, what's he coming in to do? You know, focus on that. Yeah. And so, and so that's how the work begins. We get up on our feet. We, 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 we sketch, we sketch in a race and we pencil in and we find, discover something something. We hold on to that. And then pretty soon we connect the dots. If it's a musical, I'm working on book scenes in one room. The choreographer is working on dances in another room. Eventually we'll put them together. He and I or she and I will work on certain numbers that have dialogue interspersed in amongst the, the number. You know, we'll do that together. But I like, I like to have a plan. And do you have to adjust that plan when you're working with someone like Bette Midler or Amy Schumer nope. or these big stars? Nope. No adjustment. Before or no adjustment to accommodate the fact that they're very famous. They also, the two you mentioned, are enormously skilled and have a ridiculously hard-to-measure work ethic. Bette Midler is the hardest worker, you know, I, you know, with the possible exception of Nathan Lane, I would call it a dead heat for, for working so hard, being determined to pursue perfection relentlessly. And I love it. I love it. And I, I think people like Bette and, and Amy, who, by the way, is making her Broadway debut and just was a dream in rehearsal, along with Keegan-Michael Key and Jeremy Shameless and Laura Benanti, they were so fantastic. They were willing to pass the ball. I don't know if you're a sports person, but, you know, the greatest basketball teams pass, pass, pass. They find the open man, but they, they don't hold the ball and relish it unless it's been earned and set up and the script demands it, you know? So, uh, no, I, I think working with someone like that is, you, you better hope your first idea is a good one. It's useful to be able, the first thing you say, <laughs> you know, better make her go, oh, oh, okay, you know? <laughs> and look, she was great. She she came in prepared. She got into Olympian shape and every day, I mean, you could go up into her dressing room now, nearing the end of her run, and she will, chances are, she will be looking at the script. Just trying to, trying to understand, just, she just, the desire to be as present as possible for the audience that is paying a lot of money to see her, that weight of responsibility is incredible, you know? And But my approach to the work is no different. If it were different, someone as smart as Bet or Amy or Nathan, you know, would smell it in a second. Someone's got to tell these immensely talented people when they're helping themselves and when they're hurting themselves or not serving themselves as well as they might be. And I've spent my life developing that part of the craft. <laughs> so you mentioned the audience. Let's talk a little bit about that and your feedback loop, if you will. So a show gets up and then an audience chimes in, especially when you're dealing with comedy. You're literally going to hear this feedback. Yes, yes, yes. How do you, what's your process? Oh, it's, it, well, it's thrilling. It's like going from the laboratory of the rehearsal room into reality, you know? You, you're, you get to the point in rehearsal room where the, you're running through and it feels good and wonderful. Then you go into tech rehearsals for two weeks and it falls apart, the piece, the entity. You wonder if, if it's ever going to be funny again, if in fact it's a comedy. It, it, no one's been laughing because the people who've been watching are too busy lighting and, <laughs> and setting cues and no one cares about the content. And you as an actor are been, you know, have no idea. So yes, then comes the first invited dress and reality hits. And what's great 
among other things about comedy is if it's funny, people will laugh. It's If it's not, they won't. You have about 10 to 12 minutes of goodwill from the audience before you better have, before you have them, you better have them engaged or you will lose them. So in a comedy that translates to getting the first laugh as quickly as possible or getting them permission to laugh as quickly as possible. But for me, that's the most fun is when you go from, like I say, the theoretical in the rehearsal room to the real in front of an audience and you discover things. I make most of my changes the first 10 days of previews. You, things that you think are, I mean, you, it's full of surprises. Things aren't funny that you thought were going to be funny. Things are funny you didn't expect to be funny. The play set. I always position myself behind the audience when I'm watching previews because I need them in front of me so I can gauge, feel whether they're listening or whether they're indifferent, whether they're transported or whether they're being polite. And you try to fix the places <laughs> where you feel like uh, they're starting not to care. And that's, you know, and that's called, you know, beat the clock. Because once you start previews, you, you've got, you've only got so much time before you have to leave it alone. So I love that. I think that's, that's exquisite fun. And, uh, because it's real, again, relentless, you know, the work between the director and the playwright and the director and the actors and the director and the designers making adjustments. You know, if it's a play like Meteor Shower with about 15 scenes and 14 scene transitions, I've got to get you from scene A to B and without you feeling like, without you getting impatient without you feeling like you're waiting for the next scene so that just technically is a challenge but um no it's 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 the the joy of getting in front of real people getting you know dealing with reality as opposed to the make-believe of the rehearsal room do you have a story of a show that started previews and you were like oh my gosh we got some work to do. <laughs> What's the show that had the most change in your career from first preview to opening? Wow. Well, um, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. A guy, a, you know, a Guys and Dolls was, um, was really challenging for me it, it, for, for many different reasons. And I, I didn't know Guys and Dolls when I was asked to do it. I, I, like I said, I was more a rock and roll kid. And then, uh, I listened to it and was thrilled by it. And, and we got to work on it. And, and it seemed to me that everyone, whenever I I ran into a friend and they said, and I told them I was doing Guys and Dolls or they had heard I was doing Guys and Dolls. Invariably, their response was, my favorite musical. No pressure. Right. I mean, which translates, obviously, you better not F it up. I mean, period, right? You know. And so there was a certain amount of pressure, but I was having too much fun. I, I the, the hard part in that is that I had miscast someone and I had to replace someone. And that is a direct, I'm not going to get into who it is because they're a dear friend and continue to be a dear friend. But I think, you know, at, without being glib, I think that's the hardest part of being a director is having, is realizing you have to replace someone and that having to do it because you are so altering or so impacting someone's life. But that, that was part of the, the difficulty in with guys and dolls also uh, that and 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 it was a difficult thing to navigate just emotionally and but it ended up helping the show another big thing is we opened guys and dolls with a seven, seven minute version of runyon land which was the sort of in, the introduction to the world of the show musicalized and danced but one of the problems with, one of the challenges in Guys and Dolls for me was that we opened, Chris Chadman, who was the choreographer, had created an opening seven minute Runyon Land that was killing us, that I had loved, that I had loved in rehearsal because I thought it was so imaginative and so inventive. But all of a sudden the audience said to me, you're asking me to sit with characters who are not important for seven minutes? What are you, nuts? Essentially, they didn't literally say that, but you know what I'm saying. And so I had to figure out what to do. I told the choreographer we're cutting it and we're going straight to few for Tin Horns. You know, start with the curtain up on, I got the horse right here. I mean, it would not be a bad way to begin the show. Chris, to his credit, said, no, I can do this. Let me go back into the rehearsal room and come up with a shorter version, which is what he did. So for a few nights, we started with Fugue and Tin Horns while he was assembling the new version of Runyon Land. Come down and see it, he said. I did. I said, it's perfect. We put it into the show that night and suddenly... There was 
just two and a half or three minutes of Runyon Land that launched the evening and got us to the main characters in a timely fashion. So that was, uh, you know, that, that was, that was challenging. In, in terms of scripts changing drastically from beginning to end, that's a great question. Happily, most of the scripts, well, you know, John and I are about to start on a, a, a new play. We're going to do it within the next two years. We've been working on it for five years. Five years. Just, uh, may, maybe a little more. And it's ready. And we have a producer who wants to do it. And, but if you looked at the script that the current version has evolved, and, you know, if you looked at the original version of the script and read what exists now, you would not be, you would barely be able to recognize them. And it was a process that was about John and I talking, discussing, debating, studying, pondering, querying, then him going off and writing, and then sub- sending it to me and me. So I'm, I sort of play the role of a relentless counterpuncher to, to the author, you know. So I think scripts, uh, they, they always change, you know. I can't remember one more dramatic version over another, actually. Do you read reviews? Yeah, I do. <laughs> I do. I do. I, I glance at them. I always, the, the ones that are negative just hurt so much, you know. <laughs> they do. They're like, really? You, really? It looks as though I just, just came up with this out of thin air and decided to just say, what the heck, actors have some fun. Are you, are you out of your freaking minds? I mean, yeah, so, yes, I do read them. <laughs> I wish I didn't, you know, I, I wish I didn't. And I'm reading them much less than I used to, but it could make crazy the range of opinions about your, your work. You know, I, I, I don't know. Only occasionally have I found what a critic has had to say to be used, that is to say, make me go, huh, oh, I see, I get that. Yeah, hmm, yeah. It's, it, it's, it's useful as I ponder the work that I've done. But, you know, I, I don't know. I think so few critics really know what a director does. I think you can, I think that's demonstrated by if you read most reviews, there's a, usually two adjectives to describe the director's work, which are interchangeable, you know, impressive, practical, I don't know, you know, mundane, pedestrian, delightful, you know, and so I, I, I think they serve a purpose. <laughs> I think they do, but, um, yeah, but no, I, I, I try not to take them. I try not to take them too seriously because if they say good things, you know, and they, they say they compliment you, then you walk around inflated. And when they say negative things, you know, you walk around feeling like a loser and depressed, you know. So, you know, why go through that? <laughs> so you have, of course, this very long resume of things you've done on Broadway, but you've also done a bunch of things on Broadway that aren't on your resume. In fact, the first time I saw you was with a cigar in your mouth on the escalator at the Marriott Marquis, where I believe you were called in to look at Cape Man. Yeah. You've done a lot of... Yeah. Doctoring, we'll say, over the years. Get Cherry's axe to come well, and fix the show. I guess, yeah, go ahead. Do you, do you enjoy I, that? I love it. I love it. I, as I said, I'm a counterpuncher. And what I mean by that is, early on, it became clear to me that I had, I had an ability to look at a show and sort of pinpoint what was not right about it or how it might be improved. The first musical I was asked to direct was um, the national tour of Tap Dance Kid. And I went to see the Broadway version. And I thought, hmm, you know, this is what we should do with the scenery. This is what we should do with the acting style. And I think this is what we should do with the content. And I proceeded to work on that. And we came up with with a new version. I, I, I enjoy the process of sitting back and just trying to dissect what's not working. And I, I think, you know, when I did it, when I was younger, I, I, there was a, uh, uh, my arrogance made me believe that I could fix whatever needed to be fixed. I come since to learn <laughs> that when you're doing a book musical and you have a book that's in trouble, you better get a book writer. You better not assume that just by changing the staging, you can make up for that. And so I've become better about what embracing the fact that if you want to make real changes, you need to change material. And the only way you need, the, the only way I know how to change material is by having writers who are capable of doing that. So. All right. My last question, okay. which is my genie question. I want you to imagine that the genie from Aladdin comes to visit you and thanks you for the incredible gifts of musical theater and straight theater that you've provided this community and the world with over the years by granting yeah. you one wish. Yeah. What's the one thing that drives you so crazy about working on Broadway? Yeah, yeah. It gets you fired up, uh, gets you angry that you'd ask this genie to wish away. Yeah, yeah. What, what, what am I asking the genie? Tell me again. You can change anything about Broadway that you want. Oh, oh, yes, yes. Snap of oh. a finger. 
Oh, 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 that's a great question, man. I have been so happy working on Broadway. I'm not sure what I would ask the genie to change. What I would ask the genie to do would be to reach out to any young person who is even contemplating something as lunatic as going into the theater. And I would ask that genie to, to just hold him by the shoulders and say to these young people, go ahead, go ahead. If you want to do this that badly, you go ahead and do it. No one is going to encourage you. No one is going to tell you you're doing the right thing. But you have, if you, if you have it in your heart, go ahead, do it. That, that's, if there was a genie I could, you know, <laughs> I could access, I'd have him or her do that. Well, thank you so much for that great answer, and thank you much for your, such a positive attitude. You're the relentless Jerry Zaks, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for listening. Hey, don't forget to go to onceinthesilent.com, get your tickets, read all the great reviews. We'll see you at the theater. Oh!